Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. And if you're like me, you're wondering when this pandemic lockdown will come to an end. It's been since March of 2020. And since then, we haven't been going to gyms. We haven't gone to the theater. We've been wearing masks. We've got mask mandates. One mask was good for a while, but now we need two. And yesterday I was with somebody who had three masks on. And this thing seems to be growing exponentially yet the virus does not seem to be getting worse. It seems to be ebbing. Uh, and you know, the, the thing that's interesting about this is that the masks or not masks actually seem to sort of predict your political views. And so it's become a, a political hot button as well as a, a medical or health uh, issue. And with me to talk this through as somebody who's done so much thinking about this, Jeffrey Tucker, who is uh, editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research. And he, he modestly has a short biography on his website that says he's written thousands of articles. But then if you go on to the, long, to the longer version of the website, it's more like about 100,000 articles and you've been involved with every single think tank I can, I can imagine, just incredibly prolific. And I'm, I'm really happy to be, uh, be talking with you. Hey, before we jump into uh, the pandemic and what we're going to do, where we are, and I've got a thousand questions. Uh, tell me about a, um, AIER. It, 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 I've just discovered you guys in the last year or so, and it's a very, very interesting collection of thinkers. We were founded in 1933 at a, at a time of great uh, national crisis when there was a lack of leadership in defense of, of freedom. And th those times must have been a little like ours in the sense that like weird things were going on that nobody really expected. Nobody expected, you know, uh, FDR to confiscate people's gold, you know, for there to be national price controls and, yeah. and central planning. People thought we had a constitution that would protect us from this kind of stuff. It didn't. Uh, government was really un unleashed and, and disorienting people. And, you know, f farmers were being told they had to dig up their crops, you know, and they're like, wait, aren't, aren't they supposed to be growing things? No, no, you have to <laughs> dig them up. Uh, to well, they did that in the Soviet <laughs> Union as well. Yeah. Right. So it was, there's also a time of really bad science, uh, bad science proclaimed by high level scientists, you know, that, that were celebrated uh, by the media, like John Maynard Keynes, you know, and so on, the Rex Tugwell and so on. Yeah, weird times. And uh, there was this guy, E.C. Harwood, who was an MIT professor, who started to really worry about academic freedom. He started getting notes from his dean, you know, saying, you know, we're probably going to fire you. Oh, maybe we won't. Oh, maybe we will. We're kind of running out of money. Oh, wait, here's some money. And he got sick of it. And he's like, you know, this isn't really working for me. So he founded the American Institute for Economic Research as a, a, as a research institute uh, dedicated to a genuine science, scientific principles, and enlightenment values um, to be independent of government and academia. Mm. And that was in 1933. Then, um, sure enough, by 1935 or six, he got a takedown order from from FDR saying, shut up. And he said, meh, I don't think I'm going to do that. So he kept just writing and, and, and the thing grew and he developed a lot of credibility. Now you've got, you've got, uh, your, your CEO is Ed. Uh, yeah. Stringham. Stringham. And, he, and he, yeah. George Gilder has joined there and That's John right. Tamney, a lot of people. Yeah, I, a lot of people. Amy Wolf, I think is there now. Amy Wolf is there as she's my colleague here. Uh, um, founder of Third Wave F Feminism, author of The Beauty Myth. I mean, it's a very interesting collection of people. And I, I tell you, it's, uh, I think you need these kind of intellectual sanctuaries, you know, in, in the world. I wish we didn't yeah. uh, you know, have to have them, but from time to time, we, there are these moments in, in history where there's a crisis where uh, genuine intellectuals need the freedom to speak and, and they, need, they need colleagues and the space to write. And the, you know we're 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 blessed to to be in a position to provide exactly that. I mean, you think about it, uh, Bill. There's a lot of economists who've just finished their PhDs. There's no jobs out there uh, yeah. in academia. So 
but they have talent, they have skills, and I, I consider intellectuals to be treasures of the world. So we're providing a home for them. Uh, Robert Wright, historian, is now here. Pete Earle, um, PhD candidate in economics with years and years of, of, of experience in Wall Street, writes about stock markets. And I've got to tell you, you know, from my point of view, you know, I'm the least talented among these people, um, which is great for me. I, I love working uh, within a framework of division of labor. So I don't, you know, have to understand everything about financial markets. Pete takes care of that. I don't have yeah. to understand everything about uh, 18th century uh, and colonial history because Robert Wright takes care of that and so on. You know, so we're, we've become a, a real community and our, our content's very uh, kind of interesting and unique in the sense that it, um, we're not going for, for, for I, I guess you would say sort of, sort of clicks. We're not an advertising-based uh, website. You know, we're, we're really going for um, high-level content that, that, that regular people can understand that, it, that addresses in light of good history, good theory, good principles, um, the, the world around us. And as a, as a way of kind of uh, being a light, you know, during what I consider to be really dark times. And, and so that, that's the way we've ran our editorial policy. It's like, I don't worry about using big words, you know? Well, I, my, my, you know, one of the reasons I launched this show, it began as a hobby a couple of years ago, was I, I have a, I've got a library filled with books written by you and a lot of other people that I spend a lot of time writing in the margins and yellow highlights. And I thought, you know, it'd be really interesting to take these bright people and try to make, make this into something where we can take, take those big words and maybe break them down into smaller pieces so more people can understand the, the big issues. Uh, yeah. And I'm hopeful that this is the first of uh, of many conversations we can have with you. And uh, sure. you know, I've had a couple chats with your colleague John Tamney and George uh -huh. Gilbert. So hopefully, yeah. this is more to come. So let me jump into it. You've written this book, uh, which is a compilation of some of the essays you wrote uh, during 2020, and yeah. it sort of ends at September. But nevertheless, it's a great yeah. um, overview of where we've been um, where we were in the fall. And then I think it also presages where, where, we're, where we are now. Yeah. It's called Liberty and Lockdown, Jeffrey Tucker. This is on Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Understand it. And yeah. um, terrific book, terrific overview. And so let's, let's start right in. I mean, where, um, th this is such a huge uh, issue. Where, where, uh, when do you think this ends? We'll, we'll back up into where where we are there, but this has been going on for almost a year, and yeah. we're watching the political class enjoy their power, and we're also unfortunately watching people give up, you know, ordinary people giving up their freedoms because of the uh, yeah. uh, the, the edicts that are they're pronounced. I mean, it's uh, it's shocking. It I doesn't mean, feel like America. Yeah, it doesn't. And and it's a little bit, and I'll tell you something else that doesn't feel like America is that the political class got away with it, right? I mean, that that's a little bit of a mystery, I think, to all of us. I, I think, certainly I'm speaking for, for myself, that I would have thought there would have been more resistance. But I think there's, there's a number of reasons why there wasn't. I mean, the media has been almost united since uh, first, second week of March in favor of lockdown. So that's been a strange thing. I think I think you have you have enough ruling class intellectuals that were able to 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 to, to live online, um, and disregard the workers and peasants bringing their food and delivering the mail and that sort of thing. So we we got to a critical mass where lockdown seemed uh, plausible at least for some sector of, of of the country, and then it happened in the middle of of the craziest political season of my life, where you had you know derangement on all sides, whether it was you know pro-Trump derangement or anti-Trump derangement, and so. It, it all just got mixed up and and things got very confusing. Like in, in late February, um, you had the, for lack of a better term, the, uh, you know, some, some figures on the, on the right, right wing of American um, political thought that were extremely alarmist about the virus and even apocalyptic about what was going to happen. Then you had people on the left, whether it was Slate Magazine, Psychology Today, Washington Post, even the New York Times at that point was running Articles saying, "Listen, this is a textbook virus. We should deal with it with good public health principles." And so, you know, over the course of those fourteen days that followed, from February twenty seventh all the way to March sixteenth or so, um, March twelfth, uh, the sides flipped, and and it became a heavily political issue. And and so Americans were genuinely confused by this. Um, 
and not knowing which side to be on, especially since Trump himself flipped from being, oh, this is not any big deal, to suddenly, oh, you can't, uh, we're, we're not gonna, if, if you live in Europe, you can't fly here, you know, because you're going to bring the virus. So we went from one extreme to the other, just practically overnight. And then there was this panic. Um, many Americans thought, well, there's no way that you'd just completely upend our lives and give us preposterous regulations, like don't sit, stand next to six, closer than six feet to anybody else. <laughs> Do you know where the six foot rule came from? Out of thin air. Yeah, I think it was, I, 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 I mean, the, the idea so of social- century starting in 2019, yeah. during the pandemic, 1918, it was three feet. And yeah. I, I think in Britain, they decided, well, they were gonna have to deal with this and they want people to distance and be very safe. And so instead of the three feet, they doubled it to six feet. Yeah, By it, making, it's, it, by making it's, it six feet, it, it effectively shut down all sure. sporting events and yeah. theater and, and uh, restaurants and, you know, three feet of space would be fine, but you could work with that. But six feet, you got a problem. Oh, well, you can't, you can't have, you can't have dancing, you can't have movies. I mean, it's a, it, this, this, and and the presumption behind the rule was it was strangely homogeneous uh, with regard to risk, right? So it was like applied to everybody, whether you were vulnerable uh, to severe outcomes from COVID or or if you could just get it and shake it off and upgrade your immune system, right? So it applied to everybody, whether you were sick or not or anything. It was just a one size fits all solution, and 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 really attacks the very core of of human interaction you know it's like just crazy stuff but but the crazier things got you know whether it's the masking or the you know the travel restrictions or you can't go to church on easter and it's like we we're gaslighted for a good part of, of the year um i think it, you know just to kind of fast forward to, to today i think there's a, a new clarity that's dawning one of the things that's happening right now is you've got these governments that are um, these governors that are that are gradually opening and they're trying to figure out a rationale for reopening, whether it's, it's Cuomo or they're opening in Idaho or New Jersey, announced uh, some openings today, expanding crowds from 25 to 50, but you still can't sit at a bar and blah, 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 because the bar has COVID, you know. Um, so they're trying to unravel it in a way that doesn't make them look ridiculous. So they have to cite data. They're like, well, there's fewer cases now. And it's generally true that that we've seen a 50, roughly a 50% decline in cases over the last, say, 45 days. Um, but still, what's interesting about a lot of the existing restrictions that are being repealed is that they were passed in November when cases are about where they are today. So, so there's no real science here. And you've seen a, a dearth of admission from the, from the governors and public health officials that they were they're 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 full of it, right? Well, or that they were wrong all along. Nobody's admitting that, but they so they're trying to unravel it. But as it unravels, I think the public awareness is going to grow that that well, this was crazy stuff. Well, well, in your view, was this a textbook virus? Yes. I mean, was this I, so we we had viruses, we had pandemics, you know. In 1968, 69, I went to Woodstock and I understood, I didn't know it at the time, but we we're in the middle of a pandemic. We had that's one right. in 57. We've had them back and we've never locked down like this. No, that's right. Even in 1918, which you mentioned earlier, there were a sporadic lockdown in San Francisco and Chicago and New York went on on its merry way. And public health discovered after 1918 that these quarantines did no good in terms of disease mitigation. And they swore they would never use them again. And we didn't. As you said, 57, 58 was a grim and terrible. And by the way, these these other pathogens that came along in uh, 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 57, 58 was particularly wicked on, on young people, actually, and pregnant women. Um, a much greater degree of uh, of a range of severe outcomes from the from those two flu years of 57 58 68 69 but uh we didn't lock down what we did is we used intelligence and doctor patient relationships and let people uh judge the risks of, for, for themselves but there's been um, so much dis disinformation about this you've written and, and I, I don't know your sources but americans if you pull them think nine percent of people have died from from covid 19 mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and uh, the 17. reality it's 0.04 uh, percent, yeah. and yeah. so there's this disconnect. You know, I, yeah. I talk. I think we've had a there, there's a virus, and that's a pandemic of fear of, of a virus. But then we've got a pandemic of fear that's been whipped sure. up. And the average age of death is slightly older than the average age of uh, of of the, of the American lifespan around the world. It's it's actually much higher. 
Um, so, you know, there's, and, and also the CDC says 94% of the severe outcomes with COVID were associated with additional comorbidities and only 6% was uh, COVID uh, alone. So, you know, you have a, a case of a, of a virus here that's by historical standards, pretty precise with a very definite demographic uh, target. And we should have very early on uh, uh, relied on natural immunity to create herd immunity. And, you know, I can't say for sure it would have been over, over in April or, or May, depending, because it's a migratory virus, right? So it got to California much later than it was in, in the Northeast, the United States, and the South, and so on. So, But there's about 70 days in which the virus is really hot and sort of going after its targets. But uh, there's, there's in, in, the, in the world of viruses, there's a trade-off between severity and prevalence. And so, and that's what evolution has, has created. You can look at it from a mathematical point of view, you can look at it from an evolutionary point of view, but that's always the case. To some extent, these things are self-managing. You can use a little bit of intelligence to um, protect yourself, uh, in, however imperfectly. Um, for example, it's always been the case that as people get older, they start taking magazines on how to manage old age. And the, you know, the, the advice from, from even before World War II is that if you're of a certain age during flu season, you probably shouldn't get out in, in big crowds because you're actually, your immune system's not working as well and you probably shouldn't take that risk. You should let other people get it and, and wait for the herd, herd immunity to arrive. And one of the funny things, Bill, is that this, this old wisdom I don't know what happened, it went away in the 21st century, but when this virus first came along, I, I called my beloved mother and I said, listen, I'm a little concerned about coming to see you um, because of the virus. She said, well, listen, I understand. It doesn't matter to me, but uh, she said, I consider these pathogens to be normal. But I tell you what, if we give it a month, then all the young people will get it and the virus will die out and then you can come see me. And so that's what she told me. So uh, first, she first, should have, you, sh you should have put her in touch with Fauci, Dr. Fauci. It's funny. I, I mentioned I mentioned the story to a, a a Harvard epidemiologist. He said she should have been head of the CDC. Sure, exactly. <laughs> so so we've been we've you know the so you're saying if six percent were not related to comorbidities, that's roughly twenty five thousand people out of the four hundred thousand or twenty four thousand of yeah. four hundred thousand people that people say have died from this. Yet there's so much. Uh, uh, noise in those numbers. I mean, I, there is a lot of we, if we had a regular flu season this year, I don't hear about flu. I don't hear about. No, COVID. we have not had a flu a regular flu season. I mean, you can look at the CDC right now and see that uh, this time last year. Okay, I haven't checked the data in about three weeks, but I, I did a, a month long look. Um, the whole country is painted red this time last year. This year, it's entirely green. So we've not had a flu season. So. Um, uh, COVID comes along and um, takes out people with broken immune systems. That's 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 the this, this story. It's not a complicated story. If your immune system doesn't work, you're not going to be able to handle COVID. If it does work, then you'll download the the, the latest edition of your of your uh, immune system and start battling it again. That's 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 basically the story. As for the the vaccine, you know, there's a lot of complications there. There's a lot of fear. The latest poll says 50% of Americans don't want it. Um, which is why I think we're probably not going to get vaccine passports and that sort of thing, because people are very suspicious. They made a huge mistake with the vaccine, calling it Operation Warp Speed, because <laughs> that makes people think, I don't know, it seems like this Oof. came along too, too <laughs> fast. This is a little bit suspicious. Not to mention it's our first real mass use of mRNA technology that we've had. This is not a traditional inoculation. This is a gene altering um, uh, it's, it's gaming the immune system to, to slice off the top proteins that are activated in the, in the case well, of infection. What, so what in your weird. view, do you think, uh, I mean, this has become, it is a political phenomenon mm -hmm. and there's also a, a, a narrative that is supposed to be the accepted narrative. And if you, and I've done a couple of shows where I had uh, people on talking about masks and they were, were uh, doubting their efficacy and a lot of the things that were part of the narrative, I don't think are necessarily true. And yet, if you try to say that, you get canceled. I've, yeah. and Ron, uh, Ron Johnson, senator from Wisconsin, did a piece, uh, I think, yesterday or today in the Wall Street Journal where YouTube canceled the Senate hearing. He had a doctor on that was saying that um, the virus was a lot less uh, uh, dangerous than, than, than had been portrayed, and yet, uh, YouTube took it down. Nobody's sure. supposed to have that point of view. Oh, uh, the 
the idea of these tech titans, you know, are suddenly experts in, in public health and, and viruses is is dis, absolutely despicable. I have a friend of mine who wrote, not a friend, a friend of a friend who wrote a really nice peer-reviewed study for uh, uh, a magazine or a, a journal targeted towards dentistry. And his article on masks came out in 2016, a comprehensive takedown. Of, of masks with, I don't know, like 150 uh, footnotes that masks that don't actually provide uh, virus protection. And um, so he said, you know, the purpose of the, of, the, of the article is to say dentists, you need to stop wearing these things. They're inhumane and, and they're, they're silly. So his article um, stayed up for f- four years. And suddenly about six weeks ago, the journal withdrew the, 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 the study. And, and took it down from the website. Well, it's still up on web archives, so you can read it. Um, but you don't, no, you've got, you've got one line that's coming out and YouTube and, and Twitter and everything said, well, we're gonna comply with the CDC and the WHO. Well, here's the problem. Uh, WHO keeps changing its uh, tune all the time. And so does CDC. So there's no consistent line here, right? Uh, so, I, I, I don't really understand. I mean, again, I think you put your finger on it when you talked about the politics of this. Um, at some point, uh, it seemed to the tech titans that Trump was in favor of opening it up and had fundamental doubts about the science of all this stuff. And so they decided to go the other way, you know, just because they hate Trump's guts. And, and I think that's, that's essentially it. And they, they also associate uh, Trump support with um, uh, with some, some of like you know domestic insurrection and all these kind of things, so they think they're doing good by taking all these things down, but all 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 they're really doing is interfering with the pro, uh, progress of science. Well, they they you know anything that Trump wanted, they were against, so it was obvious. But I think Trump and I was a Trump. I've been a Trump supporter, remain so, because um, I think he did a lot of good in in many ways, and uh, not all, but but many. I think he made a mistake when he tried to get out in front of this and what is it, April, March or, or April, May, where he started saying, well, I've saved three, three, four million lives because of the lockdowns and I've done all this. He, he, he tried to make himself look like a hero yeah. that he'd saved us from something terrible when in fact, what he should have been saying was, this is a typical virus, kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is something, get on with your life. We've been through this before. Yeah. The nature takes its course. So that would have been leadership, and instead, he wanted to look—he uh, wanted to look heroic. Yeah, Bill, you—you're you, the first person I, I wrote this my, myself, but I've, it's the first time I've had any talks with anybody who agrees with me about this point. So, what he went from dismissing the virus, which he shouldn't have done, uh, to overreacting. You know, there's March 12th uh, travel uh, order, and then there's March 13th issuing of a basically a, a school shutdown order that was declassified about six weeks later, and by March 16th, the entire country was shut down. And, and he himself got scared and panicked. And then he tried to justify what he did by saying, well, people tell me I saved two, three. One time I heard him say 4 million lives. Okay, yeah. that's very interesting. If, if, you know, if that's true, that he's saying lockdowns worked, that shutdowns worked. That, well, that that's, what the imperial, worked. that's when the Imperial College model said. I mean, of yeah. course, uh, that was- So he went along with it because he wanted to be a hero. But then, uh, and then you recall, there, so there was a lot of confusion in the spring, but you recall that that the governor of Georgia decided this is all nonsense and decided to open up. And you recall that Trump warned against it. He said, it's too soon, don't open up. Right? Mm-hmm. So I think that was in late April. So th- there was already a confused messaging there. Uh, Trump didn't really get his head screwed on straight until Scott Atlas showed up in, um, I think, late July, early August. And Scott Atlas is an actual scientist aware of the literature and, and spent you know, many, many evenings with, with Trump trying to explain to him um, about cell biology and public health in general and, and uh, the, 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 the demographics of risk. And, and, and then Trump got schooled and, and actually got smart. But rather than take his newfound knowledge and explain to the public what needed to be explained, which is something like, okay, we've made a lot of mistakes this year, uh, but, but here's what's what, and put serious doctors you know, on stage and have them explain. You know, he, he couldn't do it. He had already lost control of the messaging. And mm-hmm. so what he did, and I was following him very carefully during this period, during the whole campaign season, the, the, of course, then he got COVID right in October and then shook it off. And then he was convinced 
that oh this is a virus like like any virus right and but then he stopped talking about it completely i mean yeah. he, he went on to, to talk about other things you know the, the wall and shower heads and the evil of the democrats and that sort of thing so meanwhile you've got the whole country in shambles right i mean unemployment is very high you can't go to a broadway movie our ch churches we you know we missed we missed e easter and then eventually christmas and and so on and and trump you know, who came to power under the pledge to make America great again, uh, was presiding over a country where, where you know, um, in many towns, half the businesses were already shut down. I mean, the, New York was windswept and, and he was unwilling to like to talk frankly about it. He just kind of wanted it to go away. He said, oh, all they want to do is get me to talk about the virus. I want to talk about other things. And that led to a kind of disconnect. It was very interesting because here's a guy whose whole career is, is like he's had a kind of a, almost a magical ability to discern the mood of the crowd and, and embody the sensibility of the moment. Like he's like a good entrepreneur, right? He seems to know what's going on and how to respond to it. And that instinct failed him so fundamentally throughout the fall and winter. And I think well, that had something to do with um, the outcome of the election. Well, he, um, I think he failed us in that way. And, and, and uh, you know, I, you think about, I, I think there's a, there, if you could uh, make a case for criminal political malpractice, I think most of our political, at least the Democrat uh, governors and mayors are, are guilty of it because they've really locked everybody down. And if I say everybody, I guess I don't really mean everybody. I guess it's about half the country that really truly got locked down, the intellectual yeah. class, the journalist class, the people that get to work with computers and can do their work virtually, they didn't like it, but they weren't put out of work. And yeah, so- Yeah, that's right. The New York Times, uh, the, the, I did an article about the New York Times um, and their messaging on this. And they have this map where you can type in your, your zip code and, and it'll tell you, you know, how afraid you should be, you know? And it's funny because, um, uh, their their standards for you know very serious outbreaks you know it's something like eleven per uh, one hundred thousand. I live in a in a county with fifty thousand people, meaning that like five people have a PCR test that's <laughs> positive. And according to the New York Times, uh, you should not leave your home. Um, you should certainly not go to church or gather with people. You should not invite friends over for cocktails. You know you should uh, you should sh should not travel. Um, should wear a mask all the time. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting is they, they tip their sort of ruling class hand with this little remark. They say, don't go out to restaurants or go, don't even go to the grocery store if you can avoid it. Um, order your food in and have it delivered. <laughs> by whom? By, right. by people who don't read the New York Times. Apparently. Unless you're one of the people who are in the ordering, who <laughs> are the delivery guy. Uh, how much damage do you think this has done to the social fabric and can we oh, uh, I think it's been shattering and and the, the lockdowns have really um, violated the social contract we always have had with with uh, with pathogens and infectious diseases you know we're in the age of enlightenment of democracy equality and the rule of law uh, we agreed implicitly you know not, not not by a physical contract by but implicitly to e all equally share in the burden of, of, of herd immunity um, no one class could separate itself out from other people. In the ancient world, it was always the elites that, that made the workers and peasants get the diseases so they could stay pure and clean, right? This is true in, this, in the Deep South in, in uh, the 19th century, too. Is the, in this, under slaveocracy, it was always the slaves that bore the burden of, of disease. Um, and, and, and some whole systems uh, around the world, in, in India, there was a whole caste system built up around the problem of infectious disease. So you had a whole class of people labeled as unclean and forced to sort of live in a certain area and, and, and operate as sandbags for the, for the pathogen. Uh, in, in, in an enlightened uh, world, uh, under democracy, we believe in equality. We don't believe in this kind of system. Um, we all uh, deal with the presence of pathogens equally. We don't assign to some people the burden of, of getting them and getting over them uh, so that the way the pathogens are disabled and the rest of us can stay away from it. We don't do that. Um, instead, we all, we all uh, share equally. With one exception, we, we protect uh, the people who are most vulnerable, which are typically older people with broken immune systems. So we use intelligence um, 
And, and the thing about that age standard of, of, of focused protection is that age applies to everybody, regardless of, of income or class or profession or race or religion or language, everybody gets old. So in a, an enlightened society says, if you're older and your immune system is broken, you can uh, uh, hide, you can protect yourself. The rest of us will, will deal with the pathogen and then it will, it will become um, endemic, uh, will it reach an endemic equilibrium, and then you can once again come out. That's the way we've always dealt with it. Lockdowns flip that whole thing on its head and drive us back to a quarter, it's more of a feudal approach. It's like, okay, this is your job, this is your income level, um, you, you get to be clean of the virus, let's assign it to, to all the workers and peasants out there. Uh, it, it, it was, it's a brutal and, and, and primitive and medieval style of dealing with the disease. And when I use the word medieval, I mean, I'm quoting Donald uh, McNeil, uh, who wrote in the New York Times on February 28th uh, to deal with the coronavirus, let's go medieval. V very interesting article where he basically uh -huh. argued for locking people in, in cages and, and dividing uh, workers according to essential and unessential and, and uh, qu quarantining the sick as, as well as the, the well. And uh, it was a, a, a tr tremendously evil article but you know, you think about all the ways in which we have, in fact, gone medieval. We have a new feudal uh, caste system. Uh, I sit at home and enjoy my protected uh, environment while the workers and peasants bring me groceries. Um, uh, we abolish dentistry basically for for the whole uh, of summer, where dentistry services collapsed by by seventy percent. Access to medical care has been dramatically uh, down. Um, we, we've seen uh, deaths of despair, uh, exactly the kind of thing you would see in, in the Middle Ages. And we went even so far as uh, de Blasio and Cuomo blaming the, blaming the Hasidic Jews for the spreading of disease. So in that sense, we also went medieval. <laughs> so, so yeah. This has been a, a, a 12 months, 11 months of, uh, of hell, where we decided to just basically reject all enlightenment values, equality, uh, science, everything uh, to perform an insane uh, uh, social uh, medical experiment on, on the population of the US. Other governments did it too, mostly copycatting uh, the US and uh, China uh, around the world. We got a lot to come to terms with. Well, we talk about Trump and America and some states, Dakota, Florida didn't lock down and let people live their lives and their, yeah. their outcomes are actually better than those that did lock down. So there's a lot of evidence, but I, I, you know, we're a little myopic about America. You've written about New Zealand and Australia, and it, it's striking. They are they are in many ways worse than what we're we're doing here. And then uh, the UK and London, I think they just passed a law where they upped the fine from 200 pounds to 1,200 pounds if you're seen on the street at, after curfew. And it's 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 you know you're asking people for their vaccine vaccine papers. Uh, it's a worldwide phenomena, yeah. and I guess that's a, I, you know, just a little drop of footnote here. I'm a, I play tennis in the Australian Opens now, and, I, and as I understand it, if you want to play in the Australian Open, you have to go and quarantine for two weeks before the tournament, which is why they delayed it. And Roger well, they, Federer, who was, you know, he, he's now claiming a knee injury, but I think the real reason his wife oh. didn't want to go sit in a hotel room for two weeks. Uh, to wait around for a tournament. It's crazy. It's, it's unscientific. Um, the both New Zealand and Australia- You say unscientific, I say, I think it's crazy. Yeah, well, to madness. And, but I mean, but, but Western Australia, Perth just, just did what they call a snap lockdown because of, of, a, of a single case. So you've got these two island uh, paradises that have decided to pursue a zero COVID uh, policy, which is a huge mistake. What it means is that that a, a whole generation of people's immune systems will have skipped uh, a, a pathogen, and thereby rendering their immune systems extremely naive and vulnerable to something much more dangerous uh, down the road. It's also unbearably selfish and again, violating of a global social contract for infectious diseases that they're, they're, they're demanding the rest of the world deal, deal with the pathogen, obtain herd immunity out there, and they're gonna just sit and, 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 and enjoy themselves. But it's, it's, I, I knew it was coming to Western Australia and, and just like it, it hasn't left New Zealand, or it hasn't left uh, Sydney or, or Adelaide or any of the rest of it. I mean, the pathogen will, will 
be all over Australia. Now, they've got a number of ways to deal with it. They can continue to brutally violate people's rights as they did in Perth, as they're doing in Perth right now, where everybody's masked and staying at home and all this kind of stuff. Or um, at some point, they're going to have to realize that they have to become part of the endemic global equilibrium on this, on this, on this, on the uh, SARS CoV 2, or they're never going to be able to have tourism again. You know, or they're not, they've even locked their citizens inside their own country and they, they consider it a success. I mean, the arrogance, you know, of, of the political class in New Zealand and Australia is, is absolutely shocking. And it's unhealthy uh, for these people to have, have declined to uh, absorb this uh, virus into their immune systems. You know, what they're doing, they, they, you know, Bill, in, in history, what you see before the age of globalism after during and after World War One, there's many, many people around the world, you know, had not been exposed to the full range of, of uh, pathogens that exist in, in the world. And so their uh, immune systems were very naive and they can seem to live very happy long lives for a while until something goes wrong and it just wipes them all out. The history is replete with examples of these, these small tribes and small communities that seem to get along just fine until something comes along and suddenly they're all dead of smallpox, right? So, you know, th this is what we're dealing with here. Um, with with the age of globalism, what happened in the 20th century is the, the, the germs got all mixed up all over the world, and it was good for us. That's one That's of good. the reasons. Yeah, we good. one of the reasons we're living longer, yeah. better uh, uh, lives. We have the best immune systems in the 20 in the course of the 20th century. We had the best immune systems of any people in the history of the world. That's why life. One of the reasons why we lived much longer, much healthier lives it was because of exposure, not from um, sheltering in place, but let, let, by being out and about. Let me see if I can frame it. So I, we, there's so many things we can dig into, but it, it, essentially you believe, I think I believe that this has been bad science. And yet we've, we've, we've taken the, the view that lockdowns, that, that quarantines, that closing your island is gonna protect you from this when in fact it will not. And there are all these mistakes that have been made you know, starting you know, Cuomo throwing people into the nursing homes in New York, mistakes and lives have been lives have been lost, healthcare has been deferred, uh, the social costs, the suicides, the alcoholism, the drug use. That's that's they've imposed an enormous cost on on America and the rest of the world. And you, we started out with this where you said, "Gee, how do they say? Well, never mind." Where, where's Emily Latilda from Saturday Night Live now, where she goes into something? Oh well, that was all wrong. We're we're going to go another way, yeah. and you you close your book with an interesting chapter on uh, with the title, "We Need a Principled Anti-Lockdown Movement," yeah. and I, I'm looking in in your resume, and I don't see futurist on it. You're not claiming futurist, but I'm going to give you that job right now. How does this unwind? What do well, we, what's it look like six months from now, a year from now? Uh, when do we, uh, when do we, we're never going to go back to the old normal, but whatever the new normal looks like, how do we get there? Uh, this anti-lockdown movement that I, I ended my book with, I, um, I wrote that chapter and re realizing that I think, I think Bill, something has fundamentally changed ideologically and, and intellectually about us in light of the pandemic and the lockdowns. It's, it's really been a, a test of who you are and what you believe. And sometimes it's been unpredictable. Some people have approved of lock, lockdowns I always thought would fight them. Other people are fighting them, fighting them um, in, in ways I would have expected them to approve of them. So we have a new way of thinking, I think, about, about political philosophy and, and ideology and ideas in light of what's happened to us. And I see the anti-lockdown movement uh, growing enormously. I mean, when I was, for a good part of 20, 20 felt very alone. I don't feel that way uh, anymore. I mean, we, we're, we're, we're growing and we're mighty and we're working every single day and people's minds are opening up. Once you let go of the fear, that's the key thing. You know, once you get rid of the fear, then you become you know, willing to consider new possibilities and then willing to consider that maybe you, you, you engaged in irrational behavior. Uh, for for a good part of 2020, and I think that's happening to people now. Uh, I'm I'm glad in a sense to see 
the 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 Trump Biden split, you know, uh, that we dealt with through through a good part of, of the fall and winter, is now gone, and so so we can you know work towards depoliticizing this, and you're starting to see now actual science you know prevailing over over hysteria, and and these um, uh, agent based modeling. Uh, f fanatics that gave us lockdowns in the first place. So I see this unraveling uh, gradually. In fact, you know, every day there's there's another another state that's inching towards you know opening up. You know, uh, with 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 pseudoscience, right? It's like okay, now you can have 50 people in a gathering. Oh, it turns out now you can have 60% um, ca capacity in a restaurant. You know, you, you you know you can with temperature checks and plexiglass. You can now all go to the movies and so on. So they're they're inching more and more towards openness. They're going to have to. And I see the public is getting angrier and angrier and angrier at these restrictions and wondering why our rights and liberties were were taken away from us. So I'm expecting by uh, the summer and fall. Uh, and certainly by by the winter to be uh, fully back to normal, and then starts the intellectual decompression. How did this happen? Who did it to us? Why? Under whose influence? Why do these crazy lockdowners uh, reject the consensus science? How come every public health official recommended against this for a hundred years, and yet we embraced it anyway? And then that's when the recriminations start and the acts of vengeance, and, and it's going to be grim. I think it's probably going to be 10 years before we fully come to terms with the outrages and absurdities of what we've gone, we've gone through in 2020. Oh, my. <laughs> That's, that was, I think I was looking for something more uh, optimistic, but I think I, I, I agree with you. I, I do think it's going to be a long time because, and, and, and there'll still be the partisan uh, uh, cloud around this as to- Yeah, uh, and Bill, I, in terms of, yeah, I noticed that you do like this, you're sort of a, a political person, which is, which is, which is, which is great. Um, I don't see any future for any of the Republicans who acquiesce to the lockdowns. And the two greatest heroes in the Republican party, as far as I can tell, right now are Ron DeSantis, uh, governor of, of uh, Florida, who's kept, who opened up, I guess, sometime, am I right, in, in uh, July or August? And he, more than anybody else, came as close to anyone in this country to apologizing. He, he, he told the history of his lockdowns. Mm -hmm. he, he told about how, you know, he started consulting with people like Jay Bhattacharya of, of Stanford, Sinatra Gupta, who's a world-class genius in, at Oxford, and then uh, Martin Kuldorf at, at Harvard, and and upgraded his own understanding of things, and then opened up, opened up. He realized that you know that they had basically made a mistake. I mean, he didn't quite use that word, but he came very close. And now yes. Florida is living a completely, uh, it's almost normal. Which, you know, living in New England right now, I can tell you, most people around here don't even remember normal you know but in, it's it's normal in florida i was just in texas by the way and it's 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 not florida um but most bill most of the uh compliance that you see in texas is pure theater and everybody knows it you know um so things are about to fall apart there. you had and you had two heroes and i think i know that the the second one sorry we know who it is. It's Christy Mel. Sure. Yeah. And who's who? Uh, she 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 shut down her schools, you know, for like ten days, and then thought, you know what? This is dumb. This is supposed to be a country of freedom, and, <laughs> freedom and human rights. And I think society works. And I'm going to trust my people. Um, and also, she's she's just great. She didn't trust the models. She didn't trust the the uh, the aggressive, you know, claims to, to the, the, the lockdowns are scientific. She didn't believe any of that stuff. So, uh, and she, boy, did she bear the slings and arrows of the press. My still God. is, still yeah, is, still is. But those two are the great heroes uh, right now among the uh, 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 among the Republicans of, of all stripes. Whether you know it's just the you know the the party activists or the party elites. I mean. It's, it's a lesson in life. And like if you exercise courage at a at, at great political risk to yourself and you come out on top, you're going to you're going to be a hero. And those those two, I'd say, in the Republican Party deserve um, their current notoriety. And if we're looking to 2024, I'd say that 
if if they're willing to run and they're probably going to be recruited actually they would make a, a kind of a wonderful ticket and i expect lockdowns to be on the uh, uh the ballot in, in that election and and in fact every election coming forward people want to know what do you think about lockdowns what do you think about about capacity restrictions and restaurants what's your view towards travel restrictions would you believe in mandated vaccines I mean, these are the kinds of questions politicians are going to have to answer and they're gonna to have to get they're gonna to have to get smart about it they can't avoid the topic lockdowns are the issue right now it's it's not going to go away jeffrey thank you i uh I, uh, I I think you're right, and and I, I I would love to talk some more, but we've run we've run short on time. Uh, parting thoughts about where uh, where you think be, besides the political piece, where do we end up socially? Well, I think a lot of it depends on where we end up intellectually. I think we we have an urgent need for all of us to to get smart and get principled, to understand, to read, um, figure out all that information that your grandparents knew about viruses that somehow got lost in the shuffle and then and then act and then speak um, there's not a person listening to the show today who can't make a difference uh, right where you are uh, to be bold and courageous take back your rights and your freedoms and if we all do this together uh, we can be the kind of country we know we can be the kind of people that we should be uh, live the lives the kind of lives that we want to live, which are not lockdown lives, but they're free lives of choice, rationality, science, clarity, and progress. We need to get back to that. It's up to us, you know? I, mean, I don't think anything is baked into the fabric of history. Uh, history is written by its participants, and we're participants in that, and we can make a big difference, every one of us. Well, thank you. I think we all need to get back into the human flourishing business and think about... Uh, those great achievements we had to be aiming at rather than trying to tear each other apart. So right. Jeffrey Tucker, editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research and author of a terrific book, Liberty or Lockdown. And there's a lot more that to dig into besides what we've covered today. And I hope you all take a chance to, to, to buy it and read it. And uh, Jeffrey, and until next time, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for listening. We'd love to hear what you think. Uh, let me know on Facebook or Twitter where you can find The Bill Walton Show. Uh, for previous episodes, you can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and all the other platforms. And of course, at thebillwaltonshow.com, where I hope you will uh, subscribe to the show. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guests on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.